Hello Fiber friends! Welcome to the third day of Vlogmas. I hope that you had a wonderful weekend and if you're watching this sometime in the future, I hope that you are having a wonderful, cozy day today. All right, here we are. It is day three. Day three says, May every treadle press send your wheel in the right direction. <laughs> but it only really works if you are spinning with Z-twist because Z-twist is the right way. <laughs> Chris, if you're watching me do that, it's backwards. <laughs> the right way. <laughs> Clockwise. I love this fiber so, so, so much. This is more of the BFL and silk, and I hope that you enjoy these really rich, um, saturated blues, and uh, these shift a little bit into gray. A bunch of this fiber I hand painted, which means that I applied the specific colors directly on the fiber. So everybody should have the same colors but it might be a little bit variegated in different ways and that's part of the fun for me of this year's vlogmas because i get to look and see how everyone is doing their spins and how everybody has just slight color variation in their fibers even though they're all from the same dye lots and colorways i just thought that was fun a little variety <laughs> My inspiration for this colorway was that blue, blue, blue of those hot flames down in the fire. So I hope you see the blue of the flames. That's where the blue of this fiber came from. What do you think? Is it blue? How should we spin this fiber today? Because of my project over the weekend, I have an idea for which story I will be reading today. And I'm going to tell you the story while I'm spinning. So I think what I'm going to do with this one to keep our color so that we start with this gray and shift into the blue and then move into the gray, I am going to do one of the very highly requested uh, spinning techniques and that is to do a chain ply. This question comes up frequently and the question is why do I call it chain plying when many people have learned this technique being called Navajo ply? Well there are several reasons for this but one of the main reasons is that this is not a technique that is used in traditional Navajo textiles. It is not part of their spinning tradition or spinning heritage. And so for me, especially as a teacher of fiber arts, to call something Navajo ply that's attributing it to people who are working so hard to pre preserve their traditions and their heritage and their textiles. So suddenly I start to attribute something that is not part of their heritage. Well, that makes things a little murky, doesn't it? Because potentially in the future, someone might say, well, you know, this group of people must have done this technique because we call it Navajo. Hmm. So, especially for me as a teacher, I would like to share with you that particular reason why I do not call this Navajo ply. And I would appreciate if you would consider that reason and also join me in calling this technique chain ply. It might seem really small, but I feel that it's a way that we can respect each other in our different various cultures as fiber artists and fiber friends and it is something that we have the power to do even if it is in a small way. So let's get spinning. I am going to chain ply this fiber and I will do that to preserve these rich rich colors. I don't want to uh, get that blue kind of muddied with the gray. So chain plying is a way to control the color and keep it all together. I think this is going to look really beautiful once it is all spun up. So I need a wheel to spin my single. 
I think today I am going to go with my very first wheel that I ever owned, and that is my Ashford Traditional. It is a vintage Ashford Traditional, probably from the 1960s, and I painted it with some birds on it. Birds are appropriate for the story that I will be sharing with you today. So is the sewing project that I did, and I think you'll know why when I say that this story was written by Beatrix Potter. And if you're wondering why I'm doing all of these old-timey stories, it's copyright. <laughs> I was up to something over the weekend, and I'm going to show you some of the footage about what I was up to. This is the book that I'm using. It's called Embody a Capsule Collection to Knit and Sew by Jacqueline Sieslick. And... Well, I did a couple things from this book. Um, this sweater, which you can do all different variations. It's called Darren, and there's all different variations you can do on it. So you can do long sleeves, short sleeves, no sleeves. You can do crop length, tunic length, vest, or cardigan. And I got this done with just um, about two skeins of sock yarn and then a half skein of sock yarn and I had this much left. So this was a great project to stash bust a little sock yarn that I wanted to move out of my stash and I love how uh, it faded. Now this was just kind of my doing. This part wasn't part of the directions but um, then there's other stuff in here to go with it and so I've wanted to have a dress that I could wear a crop sweater with and so the next thing I'm working on this is my sewing project and this is called wool fork and again you can do different lengths and you can choose no sleeves long sleeves short sleeves you can have pockets or no pockets and so I wanted to do all the things I had exactly four yards of linen and I wanted to do long sleeves full dress with pockets, with a cute little matching belt, and I could do with or without the belt, but then I can wear this crop over the dress. So that's the project I've been working on. So this weekend I was able to get all my pieces cut out. I uh, have the interfacing done for the front and back collar. Let's see, these are the sleeves ready to sew, and that's what I'll be possibly working on next. Uh, this will be for the matching belt. All these pieces cut out will be sewn up together. And then this is the front. I have the front done. The pockets are finished. So they're nice and sturdy. So they're actually useful pockets. <laughs> um, I did put a couple little bust starts on the sides just because it's such a kind of voluminous dress I just wanted to tuck it in just a little bit up on top so the next thing is to um, sew this to the back so this fabric does have a front and a back side uh, there's one side of it that seems just a smidge more dull and one side that seems a little bit shinier usually I can tell when I put it up alongside I think this is the back and I think this is the front right side wrong side I guess so it's time to pin those together sew them up yeah there's not too much left to do I think the biggest uh, longest part of a project like this is cutting out all the fabric <laughs> when um, when it's four yards and you don't have much scraps left it's just a lot of cutting but it's almost there so that's fun we're going to go in a little bit of a reverse order. If you're just here for the tutorial, we will go ahead and start with the chain plying tutorial. Then after that, we are going to listen to the story of the Tailor of Gloucester by Beatrix Potter. I thought that was fitting since I'm working on a sewing project, we can hear the story about a tailor. So stick around after the tutorial and you can ply or spin along with me while we enjoy this wonderful, wonderful story. There are a few things that will help your chain ply be successful and one of those things is to have an extra arm 
but <laughs> if you don't have that, a uh, couple other things that are helpful is to use a tensioned Lazy Kate because that way the yarn won't just come flying off and jumble and make a ball of yarn barf before you're ready for it. Um, and the other thing is to have good control over your treadling. Uh, being able to stop your wheel while your hands are busy is really key for this ply. A lot of people will get stuck and they'll get kind of maybe a little bit of an extra twist and they have to straighten it out and they keep treadling. It's like treadling faster is going to help you untwist your yarn and treadling actually makes it worse. So being able to stop as you need to is really helpful. So I'm switching to my double treadle ladybug. I've also had quite a few requests to show how I start a chain ply. So I kind of consider the very end of the chain ply is just going to be a loss. And I fold it in half, and then I make an overhand knot. Just like that. And so this loop is the beginning of my ply. And then I do whatever I need to do to attach it to the leader. If the leader has a loop in it, then I can just kind of bring it through this leader. So now I have two loops and I'm going to bring my loop from my plying yarn through the leader. And this is now the beginning of my chain ply adventure. A lot of people find that it helps them to think of this as a crochet chain. So what you're doing is holding open the loop of yarn, pulling your working yarn through the loop to create another loop. And then I smooth the loop down together as I go and having some good tension as you come to the point that it folds over having good tension to kind of slide right through there with the twist will help you have a finished yarn that doesn't have a whole lot of bumps where those joins are because there will be a little bit of a bump as that yarn changes comes through the loop it can make a little bump there, but if you smooth it through as you go, it won't be so bad. Did have a little spot there where it kind of bunched up, so I'm just going to sort of smooth that out. So there's a lot of stopping and starting with this kind of a plying, and that is totally fine. Totally fine to stop and start as needed. See, so smooth right through there. Then when I come to the end here, I use my right hand to hold that loop open. I use my finger like it's a crochet hook so I can hook that yarn up. And then I tug on it to give it some tension and then slide my hand to bring the twist right through where that bump is. So there is a lot going on here, but once you get going, you can make a lovely rhythm of it and it becomes much easier. And I'm getting a little too much twist. As you see, um, well, not there, but here. When I fold it over, it was it had a lot of energy in it. I want some energy, but not a ton of energy. So I switched my drive band to the larger whorl, and that is gonna basically slow the wheel down because even though I'll treadle at the same pace, because this whorl is larger, it puts less twist in at the same pace that I'm treadling. So that'll help me not overply it. So if you're having that trouble, um, just adjust your whirl if you can, if you have that option on your wheel, and that will help you. People frequently ask me the question, how long do the loops need to be? And they only need to be as long as you want them to be. If you are doing a particular color control, um, 
they only need to be as long as you want or need them to be. If they are not the same size, that's fine. It won't it won't hurt anything. It's not going to make your yarn weird or anything. Um, if you are very particular about how you're controlling the color, you might have some loops that are shorter or longer to get the color to line up where you want it to be. That's totally fine. There's, there's not, it's not like each one has to be exactly the same size or your yarn's going to come out, you know, with a weird texture or anything like that. If I'm pausing my plying, if I need to get up and do something, all I need to do is make sure I have that loop on the end of my last loop where I was about to bring the thread back up, and then I hook it over something on my wheel. Like I have this little nail or screw right here that holds my orifice hook. I just kind of hook it over that so that when I come back and I pick it up, I've got that loop open for me and I can pick up right where I left off. The Tailor of Gloucester by Beatrix Potter My dear Frida, because you are fond of fairy tales and have been ill, I have made you a story all for yourself, a new one that nobody has read before. And the queerest thing about it is that I heard it in Gloucester and that it is true, at least about the tailor, the waistcoat, and the no more twist. Christmas 1901 The Tailor of Gloucester in the time of swords and periwigs and full-skirted coats with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold-laced waistcoats of paduasoy and taffeta, there lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westgate Street, cross-legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snippeted pieced out his satin and pompadour and lute string. Stuffs had very strange names and were very expensive in the days of the tailor of Gloucester. But although he sewed fine silk for his neighbors, he himself was very, very poor, a little old man in spectacles with a pinched face, old crooked fingers, and a suit of threadbare clothes. He cut his coats without waist, according to his embroidered cloth, they were very small ends and snippets that lay about upon the table. Two narrow breadths for naught except waistcoats for mice, said the tailor. One bitter cold day, near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat, a coat of cherry-colored corded silk embroidered with pansies and roses, and a cream-colored satin waistcoat, trimmed with gauze and green worsted chanel for the mayor of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked, and he talked to himself. He measured the silk and turned it round and round and trimmed it into shape with his shears. The table was all littered with cherry-colored snippets, no breadth at all, and cut on the cross, it is no breadth at all, tippets for mice and ribbons for mobs, for mice, said the tailor of Gloucester. When the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes and shut out the light, the tailor had done his day's work. All the silk and satin lay cut out upon the table. There were twelve pieces for the coat and four pieces for the waistcoat, and there were pocket flaps and cuffs and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat there was a fine yellow taffeta, and for the buttonholes of the waistcoat there was cherry-colored twist, and everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient, except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry-colored twisted silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark, for he did not sleep there at nights. He fastened the window and locked the door and took away the key. No one lived there at night but little brown mice, and they run in and out without any keys. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester, there are little mouse staircases and secret trap doors, and the mice run from house to house through those long, narrow passages. They can run all over the town without going into the streets. But the tailor came out of his shop and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite nearby in College Court, next to the doorway to College Green, and although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called Simkin. Now all day long, while the tailor was out at work, Simkin kept house by himself, and he also was fond of the mice, though he gave them no satin for coats. Meow, said the cat when the tailor opened the door. Meow. The tailor replied, 
Simkin, we shall make our fortune, but I am worn to a raveling. Take this groat, which is our last fourpence, and Simkin, take a china pipkin, buy a pennyworth of bread, a pennyworth of milk, and a pennyworth of sausages. And O oh, Simkin, with the last penny of our fourpence, buy me one pennyworth of cherry-colored silk. But do not lose the last penny of the fourpence, Simkin, or I am undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. Then Simkin again said, Well, and took the groat and the pipkin and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth and talked to himself about that wonderful coat. I shall make my fortune to be cut by us. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning, and he hath ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta, and the taffeta sufficeth. There is no more left over in snippets that will serve to make tippets for mice. Then the tailor started, for suddenly interrupting him, from the dresser at the other side of the kitchen came a number of little noises. Tip tap, tip 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 tip. Now what can that be? said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered with crockery and pipkins and willow pattern plates and teacups and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening and peering through his spectacles. Again, from under a teacup came those funny little noises. Tip tap tip tap tip tap tap. This is very peculiar, said the tailor of Gloucester, and he lifted up the teacup which was upside down. Out stepped a little live lady mouse and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands and mumbling to himself, The waistcoat is cut out from peach-colored satin, tambour stitch, and rosebuds in beautiful floss silk. Was I wise to entrust my last fourpence to Simkin? One and twenty buttonholes of cherry-colored twist. But all at once from the dresser there came other little noises. Tip tap tip 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 tap tap. This is passing extraordinary, said the tailor of Gloucester, and turned over another teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little gentleman mouse and made a bow to the tailor. And then, from all over the dresser, came a chorus of little tappings, all sounding together and answering one another, like watch beetles in an old worm-eaten window shutter. Tip 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 tap tip 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 tap. And out from under teacups and from under bowls and basins stepped other and more little mice who hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down, close over the fire, lamenting, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-colored silk to be finished by noon of Saturday, and this is Tuesday evening? Was it right to let loose those mice? Undoubtedly the property of Simkin. Alack, I am undone, for I have no more twist. The little mice came out again and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They whispered to one another about the taffeta lining and about the little mouse tippets. And then all at once, they all ran away together down the passage behind the wainscot, squeaking and calling to one another as they ran from house to house. And not one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen when Simkin came back with the pipkin of milk. Simkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry row, like a cat that is vexed, for he hated the snow, and there was snow in his ears and snow in his collar at the back of his neck. He put down the loaf and the sausages upon the dresser and sniffed. Simkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simkin set down the pipkin of milk upon the dresser and looked suspiciously at the teacups. He wanted his supper of little fat mouse. But Simkin hid a little parcel privately in the teapot and spit and growled at the tailor. And if Simkin had been able to talk, he would have asked, Where is my mouse? Alack, I am undone, said the tailor of Gloucester, and went sadly to bed. All that night long, Simkin hunted and searched through the kitchen, peeping into cupboards and under the wainscot and into the teapot where he had hidden the twist. But still he found never a mouse. Whenever the tailor muttered and talked in his sleep, Simkin said, meow, 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 and made strange horrid noises as cats do at night. For the poor old tailor was very ill with a fever, tossing and turning in his four-post bed, 
And still in his dreams he mumbled, No more twist, no more twist. All that day he was ill, and the next day, and the next. And what should become of the cherry-colored coat? In the tailor shop in the Westgate Street, the embroidered silk and satin lay cut out upon the table, one and twenty buttonholes. And who should come to sew them when the window was barred and the door was fast locked? But that does not hinder the little brown mice. They run in and out without any keys through all the old houses in Gloucester. Out of doors, the market folks went trudging through the snow to buy their geese and turkeys and to bake their Christmas pies. But there would be no Christmas dinner for Simpkin and the poor old tailor of Gloucester. The tailor lay ill for three days and nights, and then it was Christmas Eve and very late at night. The moon climbed up over the roofs and chimneys and looked down over the gateway into College Court. There were no lights in the windows, nor any sound in the houses. All the city of Gloucester was fast asleep under the snow, and still Simpkin wanted his mice, and he mewed and stood beside the four-post bed. But it is in the old story that all the beasts can talk in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the morning, though there are very few folk that can hear them or know what it is that they say. When the cathedral clock struck twelve, there was an answer, like an echo of the chimes, and Simpkin heard it and came out of the tailor's door and wandered about in the snow. From all the roofs and gables and old wooden houses in Gloucester came a thousand merry voices singing to the old Christmas rhymes, all the old songs that ever I heard of, and some that I don't know, like Whittington's Bells. First and loudest, the cocks cried out, Dame, get up and bake your pies. Oh, dilly, 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 sighed Simpkin. And now, in a garret, there were lights and sounds of dancing, and cats came from over the way. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle. All the cats in Gloucester except me, said Simpkin. Under the wooden eaves, the starlings and sparrows sang of Christmas pies. The jackdaws woke up in the cathedral tower, and although it was the middle of the night, the throstles and robins sang. The air was quite full of little twittering tunes. But it was all rather provoking to poor hungry Simpkin. Particularly, he was vexed with some little shrill voices from behind the wooden lattice. I think that they were bats because they always have very small voices, especially in a black frost when they talk in their sleep, like the tailor of Gloucester. They said something mysterious that sounded like, Buzz, quoth the blue fly, hum, quoth the bee, buzz and hum they cry, and so do we. And Simpkin went away, shaking his ears, as if he had a bee in his bonnet. From the tailor's shop in Westgate came a glow of light, and when Simpkin crept up to peep at the window, it was full of candles. There was a snippeting of scissors and snappeting of thread, and little mouse voices sang aloud and gaily. Four and twenty tailors went to catch a snail. The best man amongst them durst not touch her tail. She put out her horns like a little coil crow. Run, tailors, run, or she'll have you all in now. Then, without a pause, the little mouse voices went on again. Sieve my lady's oatmeal, grind my lady's flour, put it in a chestnut, and let it stand an hour. Mew, mew, interrupted Simpkin, and he scratched at the door. But the key was under the tailor's pillow, and he could not get in. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down to spin. Kitty passed by, and she peeped in. What are you at, my fine little men? Making coats for gentlemen. Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh no, Miss Kitty, you'd bite off our heads. Mew, mew, cried Simpkin. Hey, diddle dinkity, answered the little mice. Hey, diddle dinkity, poppity pet. The merchants of London, they wear scarlet. Silk in the collar and gold in the hem. So merrily march the merchant men. They clicked their thimbles to mark the time. But none of the songs pleased Simpkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop. And then I bought a pipkin and a popkin, a slipkin and a slopkin, all for one farthing. And upon the kitchen dresser, added the rude little mice. Mew, scratch, scratch, scuffled Simpkin on the windowsill, while the little mice inside sprang to their feet and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices, No more twist! No more twist! And they barred up the window shutters and shut out Simpkin. But still, through the nicks in the shutters, 
he could hear the click of thimbles and the little mouse voices singing, No more twist! No more twist! Simpkin came away from the shop and went home, considering in his mind. He found the poor old tailor without fever, sleeping peacefully. Then Simpkin went on tiptoe and took a little parcel of silk out of the teapot and looked at it in the moonlight, and he felt quite ashamed of his badness compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing which he saw upon the patchwork quilt was a skein of cherry-colored twisted silk, and beside his bed stood the repentant Simpkin. Alack, I am worn to a raveling, said the tailor of Gloucester, but I have my twist. The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed, and came out into the street with Simpkin running before him. The starlings whistled on the chimney stacks, and the throstles and robins sang, but they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung in the night. Alack, said the tailor, I have my twist, but no more strength nor time than will serve to make me one single buttonhole, for this is Christmas Day in the morning. The mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon, and where is his cherry-colored coat? He unlocked the door of the little shop in Westgate Street, and Simkin ran in like a cat that expects something, but there was no one there, not even one little brown mouse. The boards were swept clean, the little ends of thread and the little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone from off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout. There, where he had left plain cuttings of silk, there lay the most beautifulest coat, an embroidered satin waistcoat that ever were worn by a mare of Gloucester. There were roses and pansies upon the facings of the coat, and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except just one single cherry-colored buttonhole, and where that buttonhole was wanting, there was pinned a scrap of paper with these words in, little teeny tiny weeny writing, no more twist. And from then began the luck of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout, and he grew quite rich. He made the most wonderful waistcoats for all the rich merchants of Gloucester and for all the fine gentlemen of the country round. Never were seen such ruffles or such embroidered cuffs and lappets, but his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of all. The stitches of those buttonholes were so neat, so neat. I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches of those buttonholes were so small so small, they looked as if they had been made by little mice. The end. This is absolutely my most favorite story of all of the Beatrix Potter cinematic universe. I love all of the little details about just all of the tailoring and the descriptions of the everything and the part where the little mouse is spinning in the song. It's just absolutely my favorite. It was Apparently based on a true story, there was a legend of a tailor in Gloucester who went to bed and came back the next morning and the coat he was working on had been finished. Was it his assistant who worked overnight or was it the mice who finished the coat? I guess we'll never know for sure, but I'm going to pretend it was little mice. Maybe I will show off my new dress in... The next video, we'll see. Although I'm very partial to my oh, Santa sheep sweater. <laughs> I throw it on for my video and then I do take it off. So I'm not wearing this all day, every day, just in case anyone was concerned about that. <laughs> Here is the finished yarn from day two. This is the one that I didn't finish in the video for that day because I still had to ply it. And a lot of people were saying, this is so short, but it's so soft. So yes, <laughs> this was definitely a challenge spin. And I am so excited to see how many of you rose to the challenge to try out this really short stapled fiber. It's beautiful. My biggest tip is when you have a short stapled fiber like this, when you ply it, give it extra twist. As you can see, mine has some... There it goes. <laughs> Mine has some good energy in it, but it makes it a little bit uh, sturdier, even in spite of those short staples. So that was the charcoal spin. 
And then today we had the blue flames. So let's see what the blue flames turned out like. So I wouldn't say it's overspun, but it's probably about at the max of extra ply twist that I would want to give it, which it works because chain plying, a lot of times we do get some extra twist anyway. <laughs> so that works for me. So I wonder what we will be spinning for next time. So I would love to know in the comments how your spins are going or if you have any requests for the next spin. I will see you then. Happy spinning.